Well, welcome there, Alex Moore, buddy. It's uh, so good to have you as a return guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. Great to be back. Have you had many return guests? I was thinking that when I listened to um, the re-recording the other day. Have you had many returning guests on the show? I think I've had about uh, four or five about, I would say, now. Um, oh, but, nice. but the cool thing is, is like, yeah, see, they happened so long ago, you know, that um, the stories and what people are up to now is so different. So, um, and also because I'm just doing the podcast, like, you know, by myself now as a solo, like the, the conversations are, are very different. And so I'm like really excited to to chat to you, but Awesome. Yeah. And no, I'm glad to be here. Cause last time it was like, we were just talking about was with Craig and, and you and me. So yeah, just me and you looks good. Yeah, definitely. Great and, to and be just, here. Just, Thank you. No pleasure. But and just so you know, like this is, this is a first for me. I, I'm like wearing my flipping cap, but I, I never wear <laughs> a cap on video. <laughs> I was really? Like, I was uh, like, I was, I took a, I took a, like a um, calculated guess. I was like, Alex is definitely going to be wearing a cap. <laughs> so I'm going to try and match him. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, um, I, that's my, that's my go-to, especially at this hour in the morning. I didn't have to do my hair or anything like that. So, um, yeah, man. Oh, they look good though. They're cool. I love it. The yeah. new logo and everything. Yeah. Thanks, bud. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, so bad. You are literally a changed man. It's, it's pretty much almost impossible to recognize you based on, your life now compared to, you know, well, definitely five years ago when you were last on the, on the podcast. Um, mm. so, you know, just if we, uh, well, first of all, it's like super inspiring, right? Like I just love seeing people willing to take that almost calculated risk and bet on themselves. And I think I wish more people would do that, you know, because it just, there's, there's something so cool about doing that. You know, many people are like really stuck and, uh, they, yeah, they want to do things, but they don't do things. And then they end up becoming sad and depressed and judgmental, you know, and, uh, you know, it's all within our capability in our own hands to make those changes. If we really want to, uh, we just need to knuckle down and do them. Mm, I yeah. agree. Yeah, no. And I, I've learned that over the last, last five years. And, um, I, like I said, I was, I was just listening to the last, um, episode that I did with you guys, the interview. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, man, I don't even recognize that person anymore. You know, like everything that was on there is basically not the same anymore, except for a few things. There was a few things. And I think the one thing that kind of stuck out with me was that in the beginning, I said, look, I've, I've been, a, I was a teacher. So I was a teacher, uh, primary school teacher, elementary school teacher for like 17, 18 years. And I enjoyed it for a certain time, but I knew there's something more and I wanted to shift out of that. And I was looking and searching for something that I could do that with and, and to get out of teaching and to do my own thing. And at the time, I had my own jewelry business. I was making jewelry, selling jewelry, um, but it never quite 100% took off to where I could quit my teaching job to be able to support the family still just on the jewelry income. And that's changed now. Like I've, I've found something in the last two years that has and yeah, that's, that's probably the only kind of similarity of myself that I saw in that, in that last podcast from, I think it was April, 2019, which is, yeah, it doesn't seem that long ago that, cause I remember doing it, but it it is a, you know, a huge, uh, amount of time difference, I guess, in reality and, you know, the way that I am personally. Absolutely. But, and, um, you know, it's interesting because I've always, almost seen you as that guy that uh, is sort of always trying to look for something, you know? So like, I think, like you said, that's probably the commonality is you've always been seeking what else is there that I can flip and do, you know, so that I can probably live this like autonomous life and just have more control mm -hmm. over my time and what I do. And um, yeah, and sometimes it takes years, but to actually find that. And I think that's just part of the journey that you need to sort of you need to learn, you know, like you need to go, okay, cool. I've got to try 20 things sometimes. And, uh, mm. maybe it's only going to be the 20th thing I try that really sticks because, you know, you have to find that right combo of what you enjoy and what makes you cash. So, yeah. um, yeah, those are, those are important elements. So I just want to read a post of yours, right. From 14th of May, 2022. And I think this kind of sets things up pretty nicely, right? For 
the conversation and you know your changes effectively and your transformation mm. so this is from insta just over a year ago i discovered this book that would change me in many ways i've read a lot of self-development books over the years and man uncivilized by trevor Boom, if i'm correct in his pronunciation is the book that has resonated with me the most of them all i look back to a year ago and i was just cruising by unclear of what i wanted in the future except for one or two guys all of my other friends either live in other cities in new zealand or in other countries i was lonely and pretty much kept everything to myself i was under the mentality that sharing and being vulnerable was weak one of the first lessons i learned from trevor was was that sort of thinking was 100% wrong. From there, it seemed that things really did take off and I started to put in some changes into my life. I saw an amazing Maori healer in New Zealand who made things very clear for me, but that could be a completely separate post. Uh, I joined the Uncivilized Nation, Travis Mann's men's group, uh, where I met ton, dozens of men that I considered some of my best friends now. I attended my first men's retreat, The Way of the Warrior, I took and was mentored by Trevor and uh, another guy, Dave, in the Uncivilized Leadership and Coaching Certification. I started two new businesses. I was mentored and coached by the legend, Dr. Robert Lover, and I'm also now a certified No More Mr. Nice Guy coach. I completed the 75 Heart Challenge. So in the words of Trevor, you won't recognize yourself in a year. So, bud. I would like to know, those mm. are some ma ma massive changes, right? From reading a book, which is mm. incredible. Like, is there anything in particular that, you know, a reason that you read that book that then um, set those huge, like, changes um, and transformation in place? Yeah, so I've I've always been a fan of kind of personal development books and, uh, you know, business books, but also like self-development as a, as a whole person as well. And I, I think I saw it. Um, uh, someone had shared someone I was friends with on Instagram, shared an Instagram post, uh, by Traver. And I, I was like, Oh, this is, I like, I forget the, actually what the post was, but ended up looking into him and saw they had a book and downloaded the audio book and same thing, listened to it. Like I said, and boom, it was like, wow, really eye opening. Um, and from there, yeah, like you said, like it just really set things in motion to really get start getting things done. I was I was just kind of scooting by, you know, I was just teaching and trying my hand at the jewelry business um, and my own business as an entrepreneur. And yeah, it's, like I said before, it wasn't really panning out to where I could scale it further to then um, quit the teaching. And I don't know if that was myself holding me back because I was a bit scared of the unknown, you know, of not teach, not teaching because I'd done it for at that time, probably 14, 15 years. Um, and yeah, that, that, that really just kind of hundred percent set things in motion. And, um, yeah, kind of the book is based on, you know, it's called the uncivilized man. So on one, one side is kind of the nice guy. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum is like the alpha oh, beat on your chest on the, on the man, you know, just a complete asshole. Um, he calls it the Marlboro man mentality. Um, here in New Zealand, they kind of have the Southern man mentality, you know, which is like on the man, I could do everything and I don't need anybody's help or I don't share my emotions and things like that. And um, the uncivilized man is kind of the in-between space, like someone that can kick ass, but also is, you know, still, um, attached to their heart. You know, you're not going around fighting people all the time. You know, you, you're a lover, but also you're man enough that you can, you know, you, you're a protector as well. I was, uh, I was listening to Chris uh, Williamson the other day and he, he said something really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like, you know, you have, th there's this kind of like bit of Renaissance going on, you know, like in, in terms of men, like exactly almost what you're speaking about now. And you have, you know, a man that is, um, you know, really sort of confident in his own skin. He's able to mm. have tough conversations. He uh, like does really well, say in his business or uh, as an entrepreneur. Uh, but then at the same time, when he comes home, he's just as comfortable having his daughter draw all over his face. You know, mm. there's this like beautiful 
a balance of who he is as a person. And um, I think, yeah, I mean, the more we can try and become that person as a man, you know, the better it is, but it's, you know, it's a challenge, definitely. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, like, it's a good shift because, like I said, back in like the 40s and 50s, you know, you had that kind of Mar marble man mentality, you know, like the man goes to work, the woman stays home, he comes home, the woman does everything for him, you know, she does all the stuff with the kids. Um, and he's basically just there to, you know, be the provider, and that's it. Um, Whereas then I guess it shifted in like the seventies, you had more of kind of the, the feminist movement. You had guys jumping, going into that, you know, and becoming almost too feminized. Um, and now it's kind of like meeting in the middle and that's kind of the, the goal of it um, is to kind of work with men and help men to kind of find that middle, that middle area. The uncivilized man as Traver calls it, Dr. Glover calls it the integrated man. Um, so lots of different names for it, but yeah, it's stuff like basically it's someone who's a, who's, who's masculine, but also, you know, they're, they're not afraid of those feminine qualities as well. And, and having both those qualities is, is super important, you know, for a man and a mm. woman, um, they, they, there's something really cool going on now. And I think this is kind of always happens, you know, like there, there seems to be this, or well, there is always like a cycle that sort of nature takes, you know, and, and humans as well. And I feel that like we are now seeing the, um, you know, the sort of ends of a, of one cycle and the beginnings of, of a new one. And I'll explain it like uh, through a quote that I, that I really like and, and resonate with. It says, uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. And I feel we now like at that, that the sort of crossover of weak men create hard times so it's like it you know it feels like we've you know there's men have been kind of like simps for a, for a while now you know we haven't really mm -hmm. like you know stood up for ourselves and we've allowed things to kind of ourselves to be kind of walked over you know but we're at that crossover where now that those hard times are creating strong men again and we're seeing the sort of uprising of of men and men's groups and these sort of things and um it's just almost nature's way of like responding in real time, which is, which is pretty cool. You know, when you see everything, all these groups popping up around the world. Yeah. And like, like you said, in that post that I wrote um, previously, I would have thought it was weird to, for a bunch of men to sit around and talk about their feelings. You know what I mean? Like it was even, um, uh, let's see, 2017. So, yeah, when when like my daughter Grace had her brain tumor and like we stayed up in Christchurch, we were in the Ronald McDonald house for ages. And I went with my brother-in-law to one of his church groups. And it was kind of like that. We were all kind of together and sitting in a circle and just kind of go around talking. And I was like, remember just thinking like one, I probably wasn't in the right headspace to be doing something like that, but especially something new. And then um, but I just thought it was so strange. You know what I mean? It was so weird. I was, uh, and I was kind of like thinking, I just can't wait to get out of here, you know? And it probably wasn't maybe a year later then that this child cancer foundation put on a dad's camp. And basically like they, they brought all the dads that, you know, their kids had cancer or have gone through cancer um, to this camp. And one of the, a lot of the exercises or activities were circles like that. And it became more like at that time, okay, I could see we're all going through something similar now. I remember thinking of that church group. I was like, man, these guys are talking about stuff, but they have no idea kind of what I'm going through. You know what I mean? And I was in a different boat to them. But at this camp, we were on the same boat. Some guys had it worse. Some guys had lost their kids, you know? And then so it's like, man, who am I to judge someone else what they're going through when they've gone through a whole lot worse than me. So I can't say that anymore. Or they don't know what I'm going through because they do. So that made it more easy to share. And, you know, I did it with my father-in-law too. And yeah, I remember him like kind of breaking down in one of these and it was just really, yeah, good to see. And he's, he's not like a, he's a real heart centered guy anyway. Um, but I'd never actually seen him break down like that. You know, I've always considered him quite a strong guy um, in all sense of the word. And yeah, just seeing him break down about grace and, you know, the things that he was feeling and thinking and yeah, was really great. And that kind of, 
then took it to the next step, which was in like in that post, I went away to this men's retreat, Way of the Warrior. And it was so much easier to sit there and share with everybody. And there were guys, I remember sitting there who were, this, this is their first type of thing like that. And they were like, I can, I can just kind of picture them sitting there, like the look in their eyes, like, what am I doing here? What am I, you know what I mean? And I was like, I remember that. I remember what, how you were. Um, but yeah, and that was able, made it so much easier than join a men's group. And there's men's groups joining, popping up all over the place. And, and like I said, at the beginning, I was lonely because I've, lived in a new country or my friends were elsewhere, you know, but last of my time, I made a lot of good friends was in London, you know, with the, with you and the, the AFL team, you know, it was like that common group of guys coming together. Um, but yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's important for guys because as we get older, we find it harder and harder to make new friends outside of work, you know, especially with a lot of people working outside of the, office now working from home what do they have their families and then yeah their their work colleagues on zoom and maybe a, a buddy or two but yeah i think it's a lot of guys struggled in especially over the last three four four years so yeah this whole movement of men being able to come together and not be judgmental or not be like feel weird about it you know it's just it's just guys hanging out and that's what we're supposed to be doing you know not supposed to be sitting alone um at home all day long or just hang out with our wives nonstop and relying on our wives to like fill our needs of, you know, every single need. That's what, you know, exhausts the women is having to feel the, that bucket of the husbands as well. So um, that's what, yeah, the importance, I think it's great for men's groups and men's communities and they're all over the place now. And yeah, I think it's, it's huge that they're becoming more and more popular. But tell me also, please, about the the Maori healer. I'd love to know oh, yep. what uh, yeah what that all was all about. Yeah, so, um, my wife, I forgot how we heard about him, but yeah, my so my wife Paula went, and she came back. I remember that night, and she's like, "Oh my God, you got to go see this guy. He's amazing. He was able to tell me all this stuff about you." without even me having to like tell them about it. So excuse me. <clears throat> um, so he does this uh, practice it's called Hona Hona, which is, and he's, like I said, he's a Maori um, healer, which is like the native people of New Zealand. Um, so he kind of can feel different things in your body and kind of, there's different, points in your body, which kind of relate, I guess is the right side is more masculine. The the left side is the more feminine side. Um, when you're talking about energy and yeah, he can kind of, he does these kind of massage and he works these kind of knots and stuff out, but he can kind of feel them within you. Uh, sorry, feel them in himself. So he's kind of like an empathetic healer. He calls himself. Um, so after that, I booked an appointment with them and went in and, and basically that yeah, she was right. Like, it was amazing. Like, I remember the very first thing was, um, he was like sitting there and he's like, Oh, do you have any, um, pains like in your, so I had, I was having like pains in like my, my right shoulder and like going down to like my back a little bit. And he, and the first thing he goes, he goes, and this is about any, he, I, I didn't tell him anything. It's not like I gave him like a, you know, like one of those forms that, Oh, do you have any pains anywhere? Um, he basically goes, are you having any pains like in your right side, like in your, your shoulder, like in your back and stuff? And he's like, maybe down to your buttocks. And I was like, yeah, I am. He goes, oh yeah, that's your, and he goes, um, it's something like some that's your father's father's side. And he goes, is your, is your, is your dad like really in his head and, you know, not in his heart and kind of a real kind of quiet guy. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much like my dad. And, and then, um, but I was kind of thinking too, I was a bit skeptical and I was thinking, okay, maybe he just says it to everybody and hopes that it's true. You know what I mean? But there's one point of it um, that he kind of really blew me away. And so over the last probably hmm, four, three, four years, I've been having like some issues with my left ear. So I've been having like tinnitus um, all the time. And then I had some like hearing loss and stuff and yeah, so there's some weird stuff that went on with I could probably talk about later, but some of it probably I think came down to stress. But um anyway, there's there's issues with my left ear. So he goes, Are you having any issues with your left ear? And I was like, 
Yeah. I was like, well, what is that? And he goes, um, he goes, that's your, I'm I, and he, he's like, I'm feeling there's a grandmother that's passed and that's what that is. And he's like, she's like coming manifesting through that. And he's like, kind of feeling her. I don't know if he, I don't know if he like sees, or he kind of, like I said, he feels all this stuff. And he goes, um, I feel that she was like, not your typical, like old, sweet old granny type of lady. I feel she's like a real kind of uh, strong woman, really almost like a masculine, a masculating, you know, not a man hater, but just kind of like, you know, yeah, kind of mask, like, I can't even say the word, sorry, but yeah, with your dad. And I was like, oh shit, that's 100% spot on, you know? And so, and he goes, um, he goes, I feel that she has a message for you. And she said, she says that you are to help your wife and her work because it's really important. And my wife, Paula had probably just started coaching as well for the last, um, yeah, maybe six months or something like that. So yeah, I was just kind of like, holy shit. But he was able to tell, like I said, he told me all those things. He's like, I feel like you're a teacher because you're trying to help these kids um, be like their father figure, um, whether you like it or whether they need it or not. So he's like, I actually feel that you are meant to work with more teenage men and like men. And he's like in some sort of like mentoring, coaching uh, fashion. And like I said, this is before I did any type of like coaching or anything like that, even got the certifications. Um, yeah, so he was able to tell me all this stuff like that, and it was quite a, it was quite mind blowing. But um, yeah, really awesome guy, um, and quite a, like I said, you just got to be open minded about it because I was a bit skeptical until my wife came back and she's telling me this stuff, and I was like, holy shit, you know. So, and then when I did it myself, I was like, wow, this this dude, um, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, so crazy. I, I I've actually had like a kind of couple of experiences like that as well, and and. I don't know what it is about these people, but they, they just have this insane ability to, to pick up, I don't know if it's, if it's souls or energy or, mm. or what it is and somehow decipher whatever message they're receiving and, and tell you, even if yeah. they, like you said, like the, the guy had no idea about your stuff, you know, and you're like, and, but he told mm. you quite specific things that are probably yeah. impossible to know, you know? So it's, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, and I, and I also had, um, I also had some like, pain like my forearm i'd like kind of it's a strained muscle or something like that and he was like that's that's a creative pain or that's the so he's like i feel like there's some type of uh entrepreneurial endeavor coming coming ahead that's what's kind of that's what that pain is it's kind of holding in there and like you need to release it and to actually do it you know it's kind of my body was holding on to that entrepreneurial energy i guess you could say like you said i don't, I don't really know what it is 100 percent, but that's called an energy so yeah and that was kind of like yeah also mind-blowing and like okay it's time to get shit done you know let's do this stuff our bodies our bodies are these amazing vessels almost that you know they send us messages all the time but probably 99 percent of the time we're just not ready to accept the messages or we're not tuned into our body that well and mm. you know that's what a lot of like i guess sort of more spiritual kind of work yoga work breath work and stuff um i guess focuses on as well you know they'll be like you know you might you should do these breathing exercises because it's going to help you identify where you have blockages and, and that sort of stuff and mm. you know you take like wim hof for example that guy has insane um a sort of results from people doing the Wim Hof um you know breathing um, mm. like curing cancers and, and other diseases and ailments and stuff uh purely because they're like breathing properly and they are unblocking certain blockages in them and and it's just like it, it's kind of mind-blowing you know like how mm. how smart our body is um and how like out of tune we are actually with our body uh so so yeah when you do find that like like amazing kind of balance of or, or understanding of your body yes yeah, it, it changes everything i swear mm. and tell me about your two new businesses <laughs> um so one of them is 
my coaching business. So it's called Forged by Fire Coaching. And like that started pretty much um, maybe six months after I went and saw the the healer. Um, so after that, kind of a couple months later is when Traver and Uncivilized, the Man Uncivilized program announced that they're doing a coaching certification and leadership program. So I took that then, and that was probably three or four months, I think it was. And um, so then launched my coaching business. And then a few months later, that's when I um, took the No More Mr. Nice Guy coaching certification through Dr. Glover. So with Dr. Glover, so that was another like three or four months. Um, and then in November, 2021, I started my um, food truck, Buffalo's American Food Company, um, which is something that I've kind of had in my mind that I wanted to do for a long time, but always was just holding myself back, scared to do it. And yeah, that's, that's basically um, kind of my main income now for the last two years. So I, I quit teaching. I took a leave of absence last year um, and then had a year off last year. And then this past October, put in my final resignation. So yeah, I was still employed by the school, but just on, just not, you know, I, had, I was off for a year. Um, and then, yeah, officially resigned a few months ago in October. And yeah, my official end date was like the end of 27th of January, something like that. So yeah, that's uh, official now. And yeah, so basically doing the food truck three days a week and then coaching um, fills in a lot of the other days off or a lot of the other times on my days off and um, a few other things too that I'm working on, um, like my t-shirt here, Integration Nation. Um, and that's like we talk about men's group. This is a men's group that I was asked to about a year and a half ago start with Dr. Glover. Um, so he reached out to like six of his coaches and told us, hey, look, I'm looking to build a men's community and I want you to help me build it. So I said, hell yeah. And it was um, about a year, yeah, about a year of kind of building it, you know, putting it all together, how it was going to run, what it looked like with all these other coaches from around the world. So there's about seven of us and we would meet um, quite early mornings every Saturday morning for like a year. Um, for a few hours, uh, yeah, it was like four thirty in the morning for me. But yeah, just learning so much about one building businesses, two, you know, working with Dr. Glover, who's like the basically one of the one of the goats of men's work. You know, one of the gurus. Like, there's only a few up on his level. Probably like David Data. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Yeah, there's not not many on his level. Um, so yeah, when I heard, when I got the opportunity from him, I was like, hell yeah, sign me up. So that's been going well. We launched this past July um, and now we've got like 400 men in the community and yeah, it's awesome. Like just to see, like we have, so like us coaches, we lead our own kind of tribe. Um, and so at my tribe calls are on Monday nights. And so I get guys and it's called the thundered from down under. So the idea was to get guys from like Australia, New Zealand whose times are going to be a bit off from the U S but actually because of the time zone, like we get guys from Australia, New Zealand, but then we get guys who are waking up like four or five, six in the morning in the U S to attend the calls and then guys in Europe in the afternoon. So we get guys from all over the world. Um, but just hearing like these guys stories of how much they needed this and, you know, the changes they've made, the support that cause of the support they get in the, the groups, you know, and it just takes us back to, like we said, this is what men need that they need that connection and they're not getting it anymore, you know, through different, for different reasons. And yeah, so it's been quite a journey over the last few years of those businesses. So, um, yeah, the food truck was, that's, that was an awesome one too, that I probably wouldn't have done without doing the work on myself. And, you know, I had a little bit of help from my wife, Paula, and I remember I'd been looking, but everything we'd looked at or I had looked at the trucks that were for sale were either too expensive or there were like, you know, um, on the other side of the country where to even look at it, you have to fly somewhere and then it was just a, a hassle to do. And then a buddy of mine messaged me and said, Hey, there's a, a food truck that sets up in towns for sale. So I said, Oh, so I messaged the guy I said, Oh, how much was, how much do you want for it? And he's like, you know, told me the price. And it was about 
a quarter of the price of some of the other ones that I'd looked at. He was just wanting to get out of the business. So I was like, damn, I was like, shit, this could be it. And I was kind of went and looked at it and I was like, okay, cool, cool. Um, I said, um, yeah, give me, give me a, a day to decide. And I was kind of humming and mm, should I do it? You know? And I remember my wife, Paula saying like, what could, what's the worst that could happen? And I was like, mm, that's true. I think I was a bit, just a bit scared, hold myself back. And I said, well, the worst could happen is we probably sell it for double what we paid for it. So she's like, well, let's do it then. So I was like, shit. Okay. Had the funds, you know, and bought it and yeah, the rest is history. And it's, that's been absolute huge success, you know, like, so we do American smash burgers, like smash burgers and like some fried chicken and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of hit a gap in the market in our town that we're in in Cromwell that we didn't know it needed. So we're kind of not like a fish and chip shop type of prices and, and quality and not like, and there's a few like more higher end restaurants that are pretty pricey and we're kind of in the middle there. Like we do, um, we call it fresh food as fast as we can because, you know, we're so busy. Sometimes we get like on a Friday night, get up to like an hour or wait and people are like, yep, that's cool. I'll wait. They know it's good. So they're happy to wait for it, which is, which is amazing. So yeah, it's been hugely successful. So we've been, yeah, super stoked with how this gone. And it's, and it's allowed me to accomplish those dreams of getting out of the teaching and working on my own and doing, doing, I wouldn't say hundred percent my own hours because we do have like a set schedule that we're open, but you know, I'm the, I'm the owner, I'm the owner operator, the boss. And yeah, it's just uh yeah, a dream come true really. Yes, but that's so amazing. But I, I think it's uh, it's super, super awesome. And, you know, once again, these are things like, you know, they, they're also new things, you know, it's not like it's like mm. say maybe your expertise or whatever. And I think that's even, even more inspiring. Like people must know that you, you can actually learn to do things like, like jump off the deep end. Sometimes it, it can yeah. really be the well, right thing to do. It's uh it's a bit funny because my first job ever, my first real job when I was 16 was at a place in the States called Dairy Queen which was like a fast food ice cream. They did burgers, but they also did like a lot of different ice creams and stuff. And I worked vet there through high school for two years. And a lot of the stuff I do now is very similar to what I did then when I was 16, 17, 18. Even I've taken some of the methods of things I used to do that I remember I did um, and kind of used them in my food truck, you know, just things to make things easier and, you know, how the kind of methods of different stuff. So yeah, it's funny how it came full circle where I've never thought then that I was going to ever use that stuff again, use that knowledge of taking the cheese and stacking it like, you know, um, corner edges. Cause so it doesn't stick, you know, and so you can easily peel it when you're in a hurry. So yeah, just, just random stuff like that, you know, like who thought I'd ever, you know, be flipping burgers again. So yeah, but I love it. So and my wife works on the food truck as well and she loves it. When we first got it, she's, I was joked that she was going to work there and she's like, I'm never going to work in the food truck we'll kill each other. We'll end up getting divorced. And so I was like, all right. So she didn't. And then we had a staff shortage. One of our workers quit. So we needed her to work on the cash register in like front of house. She did it one night and absolutely loved it. And yeah, the rest is history. Now she's, um, she loves, she loves working with people and talking to people. So, um, yeah, it's kind of her cup of tea. And she actually, we were in this kind of burger competition last year. So we were a finalist for the best chef. I was the best chef finalist in the, in the, the, the region, which is a bit funny. And then uh, for the best burger, we were finalists. And then she actually won uh, the best front of house um, award for it. So that's kind of our, yeah, that's pretty cool because that's kind of what we pride ourselves on is customer service. And I think that's why we have been so successful, not because the food is amazing and everybody loves it, but they also love the customer service as well, because a lot of places you don't get that um, type of service. So yeah, it's amazing how it's come full circle from 16-year-old Alex at Dairy Queen to business owner and burger flipper. <laughs> but that is the best story ever. And it's also so cool that you and uh, Paula are, are doing it together. You know, I mean, I guess mm. you know, if you look back to your time in London, she was an accountant, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. And, and now that's you, right. Yeah. You, you're both coaches and you, and you make, uh, make burgers and, and fish and chips. What a, what a pleasure, but what a, sto what a story. <laughs> <laughs> no fish. We, we don't, we don't do fish though. Cause I don't eat fish. So I was like, nah, we're not having fish in there. We always okay. get asked, but we have, we haven't done fish yet. I want to, because 
one of my best friends, Wayne in the States, he, he, he just eats fish. Uh, he doesn't eat um, red meat or anything. So I want to do, I did another burger from another one of our best friends, Skip, the Skippy burger, which was just loaded with cheese. But I want to do a Wayne head burger because Wayne was a bit sad that he didn't get a burger named after him. So I want to do a fish burger named after Wayne, but yeah, burgers, <laughs> burgers and fries and fried chicken and stuff. So oh, happy days, but that's so cool. I, I was wondering, like you, it feels like you have this almost a newfound, like self-belief, uh, you know, how was that received by your wife? Um, I think she knew I had it in me and believed in me. And I think that was a major part of why everything's been so successful is because I had her supporting me. Um, and yeah, I think it was for her, for her, it was, how do I get this out of Alex? You know, how do I get him, push him to do that without pushing? Because that's the last thing men want, or probably anyone in general, someone constantly nagging at them, pushing at them, you know, Oh, you can do better. You can do better. You can do better. You know? And I think that was why she was kind of been such a fan of like the men's groups as well, because she saw that push and that accountability from other people besides herself. One of the things that I've learned about like relationships and specifically like women and what men almost get wrong about women is that their almost number one need is uh, to have clarity, security, and certainty in their relationship, mm. right? And mm -hmm. that often goes wrong with blokes because, you, you know, you get married and then comfortable and the guy like, I don't know, he starts drinking a bit too much beer, gets a bit of a bad bod, watch, starts watching too much sport or I don't know, you know, porn or whatever the story is. And, you know, um, so that security, that clarity of like who this guy is, is like, is not there anymore. And, um, mm. you know, if, so effectively they have like a vision. They're like, they're always visioning you. Like, this is the man that I, that I want to be with, like a future version of you, you know, like, but then when that vision starts becoming less clear, like, you know, uh, then that's when that's when things start uh, sort of going sideways. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden one day the wife goes, uh, you know, I'm done. And the guy's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, you know, I've, I've been providing for the family and, and doing all these things. And like, you know, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And then, but they don't know that that's not really what the, the woman wants, you know, they want the security and this clarity and this, they have this vision of you. And, uh, yeah, so it's it's great that um, you know that that I guess in in your scenario that uh, you became that guy who 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 <laughs> she probably thought you you know you 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 were going to be. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's like we talked a little about Chris Williamson and Dr. Glover, and so Dr. Glover was recently on Chris Williamson's podcast, and there's kind of a clip that's gone on through the uh, through Instagram of Chris Williamson with Hermosi with Alex Hermosi. Um, saying, you know, he's like, oh, I just had an interview with Dr. Glover. And he's got this quote, the essence of an attractive man is someone is a man who essentially knows what he wants, knows how to get there and has fun doing it, has fun getting there. And they were like, wow, yeah, true, true. And then Dr. Glover on his spot, like on the actual podcast on that interview, says it and he's talking about how all these you know when he says that to women or he says that to podcasters interviews they're almost, they're all just like ah you get it you know what i mean and it's exactly what you said it's like it's not about just going out and making a bunch of money and bringing the money home and then you can just sit on the couch and do nothing like it's a whole lot more to that you know to it and you're right i think it's where a lot of guys get it wrong as that's what they think they have that mentality oh i just got to be the provider and that's it you know what i mean and the woman can she runs the household she does everything else and that's when the men just seem to get a bit lazy um and become less of the leader and you know issues happen i'm lucky if like i've been in that same such a situation and you know my wife and i are able to talk about it and she can call, like bring me up on stuff that i'm not doing and i can kind of then self-evaluate and assess and be like shit yep i'm not i'm letting the family down in this regards i need to step it up a bit more 
in this respect, you know, or, and just make some changes as we go rather than letting everything build up, build up. And then, like you said, like some people would just be like, no, we're done. I'm tired of this without even kind of mentioning it and just hits guys like a, you know, like a door in the face or like a, like a brick wall, just boom, where'd this come from? Shit. You know? So I'm lucky to have that in my relationship where Paula can bring stuff up and we can talk about stuff and yeah, she can kind of call me out on different things and the stuff that I'm not doing or things I am doing um, that need to work on. So yeah, it's uh, amazing in that sense. I'm lucky in that sense too, that I found someone like that. And also that you open to it, you know, like a lot of guys like, mm. on like, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, you stay in your place, sort of thing, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, yeah. which is a big problem for sure. Like you have to be, you have to be receptive and you have to be able to listen to, okay, cool. Where, where am I going wrong? You know? And it's not like they are intentionally criticizing you. They're actually trying to help you guys, especially as a couple, you know, they're like, well, listen, this is, this is, this will make everything great again sort of thing. So we, so it's good that you are receptive to it, you know, because it's, just as easy for many blokes to go, oh, well, I'll go find another chick or something like that's another wife, you know, then that, mm. that seems to be half the problem, I think, these days. Um, and that's actually a nice segue because you've been speaking about uh, Dr. Robert Glove and, and I actually spoke to him, I think, two days ago, thanks to you, but I mean, thanks to you for <laughs> setting that up. Like, what what a legend. I, 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 it, was, it was a great conversation and just a really cool, cool guy to speak to. And um, you're now like uh, one of his uh, certified coaches, um, and there was another thing that of yours that I'd like to read out and you wrote it, sure. a, you wrote it a while ago, right? And it's pretty short. You said the first 10 years of my marriage, I lived the mantra of happy wife, happy life. I was passive in every aspect of my life. I disregarded and abandoned my own needs and wants looking for others, happiness other than my own. Now this seems like quite a common trait among men. Why do you think that is? One, I think it's kind of magnified by like social media and the internet. You know, you get these different posts of saying, oh, happy wife, happy life. And it's kind of turned into like a joke, you know? Um, it's kind of like, oh, that's what married guys do, you know, happy wife, happy life. And then they're just kind of trying to make their wife happy to make it so they're not they can just keep doing what they're doing. You know, they don't have to work on themselves. They don't have to do anything. They can just keep going with the status quo. Um, yeah, I think, and I think it's just easier, you know, if you can people please enough where people are, don't want anything, you know, like how you give your wife anything she wants and um, let her do anything she wants, then she's not going to nag you. She's not going to bother you. And you can just keep sitting on the couch, watching sports, drinking beers. Um, and yeah. So I think it's kind of uh, guys that follow that mentality. It just makes it easier for them, you know, and that's what they think. That's what they kind of have come to think of. That's what a marriage should be. You know, it's almost become the norm because that's what they see on online. It's, it's just a joke, like in, like TV shows, things like that. Like think of all the TV shows where the husband's just this like kind of bumbling idiot, you know, like stuff like the Simpsons or, uh, I'm trying to think of different uh, love and marriage. one that I grew up with love and mar married with children you married know another children. one sorry, with, sorry, that uh, was yeah, yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> Al, Bund Al Bundy um, yeah. is it Al Bundy yeah I think yeah. so yeah um, yeah so many shows like that you know and so it's become the norm that oh yep you get married up oh, your life's over oh they're all ball and chain you know like that sort of thing and um, I think that's what guys are just kind of think that's what it needs to be it almost feels like it's this subtle programming that is, I mean, you can go down the conspiracy sort of route, but it's almost like being mm -hmm. dropped into sort of society's consciousness, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, I don't know, maybe uh, weaken society in, in some ways. And, um, you know, like, that's why we see guys that are like, you know, they're losing that sort of masculinity, that that sort of action taking uh, leading sort of uh, qualities that that we we should really be um, you know using and 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 following you know uh, as men. Um, mm -hmm. I was uh, what was I going to say? There was something around that that I wanted to mention. Um, 
I forget what it was now, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's really like, it is really fascinating how many guys, um, you know, are in that sort of same boat. Um, I, I find it like with my own coaching as well, you know, like you have these guys that are like, just like total sort of people pleasers. Um, and especially mm. when it comes to their marriages. Um, so, so yeah, that also brings us on nicely, I guess, to, you know, something that you've been working a lot on uh, as a certified coach, like, which is the nice guy syndrome. Maybe you can just tell us what is a nice guy syndrome? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a hard one to put into a few words. We'll see what I could do. So the nice guy syndrome is basically when men think that they need to be too nice, but in a manipulative way to get things that they want. So they feel like they have to people please. They got to avoid conflict. They, um, yeah. So they're, they're just trying to be kind of manipulative, manipulative, not always like in an on purpose way, but it's almost like a subconscious thing that they need, they're doing to try to get people to like them and to try to get things that they want, get their needs met basically. Um, and that could be through like romantic relationships, you know, or could be in like work relationships. They're always just kind of, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to, um, yeah, upset anything or disturb anything. They just want to keep going nice and easy. And, you know, if they, uh, need something, then they'll kind of use little ways to try to get it without actually coming forth with what they need. For example, like one big thing is called covert contracts. So that'd be like, basically they're doing, for example, let's say a guy wants to uh, have sex with his wife. Okay. So he's going to be vacuuming the house. He'll be doing all the dishes. And then, so he's thinking, oh, if I do all this stuff, my wife wants to have sex with me. But then his wife gets home and she's like, oh, you cleaned up. Nice job. And it goes on with her day, you know, or even doesn't even notice. And he's just like, what, what the hell? And he gets all mad and um, upset and resentful because she doesn't want to have sex with him. He's like, well, why not? Well, he's had that contract with himself. She had known nothing about it. And so, yeah, that's another uh, symptom of the nice guy syndrome. A big one is the covert contracts. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a thing that Dr. Glover, I guess, coined the term of it. Um, and you get people that hear it, they go, oh, you don't, why not? you don't want to be a nice guy. What you want, you want people to just be assholes. And it's not that way. A nice guy is too nice, but not genuinely nice. You know, he's doing things with ulterior motives, for example. Um, and a lot of it stems back from having a lack of a masculine mentor or a lack of, you know, healthy masculinity growing up. A lot of the stuff like this, um, starts forming when we're kids. Um, whether it might be sometimes like the father has left, you know, and, and just left the mom and the, 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 the boy or the, the, the kid. Um, so she's having both the masculine and feminine roles of raising the kid, or even sometimes like it could be, you know, the dads are out working all the time, you know, which is a case, you know, in this kind of generations um, or previous generations, like our, our age, like early forties, thirties, fifties, the dad was off working and the mom raised them. You go to school. How many of your teachers were men? Not many, maybe one or two out of like eight years of primary school type of thing. High school, you might have a couple more. Um, yeah. Spending time with grandma, living with, you know, babysitters, mostly always female. So yeah, all this stuff starts becoming over. The man becomes over feminized and with that lack of you know, healthy masculinity. And that's what kind of leads to this always trying to please the women, always trying to please the women because he wants to get his needs met. It's kind of like a survival mechanism that we have in our brains, you know, like if we're good as babies, yeah, that's how we go. Oh, we gotta need to get our needs met. If we're not, we're going to die. You know, we need to get fed. We need to get um, sheltered. We need to get changed and stuff when we go to, you know, go to the bathroom, stuff like that. So yeah, that's kind of where the the background comes, but it's a, a huge thing. And it's really, you see it a lot now. It's coming more and more popular. Um, but yeah, Dr. Glover, he's the one that founded that. And yeah, it's been amazing kind of learning about it um, over the last few years from the, like I said, the guru himself, the man himself. So um, yeah, 
it's interesting reading the book because I mean, some of this stuff is like, it feels like he's speaking to you, you know, like I was mm. reading some of this stuff and I'm like, oh, well, fuck, uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> <laughs> that's, I've got a little bit of that in me, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're like, but nah, you know what I mean? You're like, no, nah, no, nah. it's, it's like, this is, this is a hard thing for a man to uh, be honest about and to have that sort of reflected back towards you, you know, like facing mm. the reality of like, okay, you have some of these elements in you and you actually need to do something about it is, is very tough. Like um, it's almost tough for anybody, you know, to sort of, mm. uh, to sort of face, okay, cool. These are the issues that you have. You need to, to resolve them. Um, because he, because he's like, I mean, he, he pinpoints, he pinpoints certain things and, uh, they, they, they hit you like, you know, he's like, he's like pushing your buttons <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I was reading it and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I've, I've had a few of these tendencies for sure. Um, I feel like I, you know, like some of them I've, I've outgrown, some of them I still definitely have to maybe work on myself. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's great work that you, that you're doing and, um, yeah, well done. It actually reminds me a little bit of, um, and, I mean, it's not related necessarily at all, but, but I think it's, I mean, not, not, not at all, but there, there's definitely some relation is, is Dr. Warren Farrell. Um, he, I think, I know you know him because he's speaking at your integration nation soon. Um, and he wrote a, an amazing book called the boy crisis. Mm. It's a fascinating book. Uh, where he talks about like this is specifically around like America, right? And but it's the the it happens all around the world. I think the the um, the patterns are are the same around the world. Um, whereby, like say in America, there's something like 19 million families that are growing up without a father. I mean, that's crazy, mm. right? That's a that's a lot of um, a lot of families, and and leads to things like higher incarceration rates. Uh, higher crime rates, uh, more drug use, uh, lower literacy, just like, like, like much worse behavior, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then those patterns are then, uh, probably repeated, you know, uh, within those people's lives because there's, there's even less of a lack of mentors for blokes. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there seems to be this like, um, there's a commonality between the nice guy stuff that you guys are are teaching and also that actually it's a result of there not being, you know, m many father presence um, in so many guys' lives. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I've not read that book, but you're right. He's going to be on the uh, Integration Nation. They have monthly guest speakers um, that come on, but he's, I think, in May. I think it is coming up, but. Yeah, it all 100% makes sense. And then when you read kind of No More Mr. Nice Guy, and you kind of see, okay, you see where this stuff starts to come from because, and it's this big cycle because unless you're conscious enough to break the cycle and you find out, okay, this is what needs to change. And like you said, it's a bit confronting of things that might not be right with you, you know, that not necessarily there's something wrong with you, but there's issues that need to be worked on, you know, and some people are... Um, not open enough to do that. And like you said, I think when I'd say probably 80 to 90% of, of guys who read No More Mr. Nice Guy, they think after they read it, shit, that book's been written about me. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, and, and like you said, it's not every, you don't have to have every single symptom to be considered a nice guy. You might just have a few. Um, like for me personally, like how we talked before we started recording is that I first listened to it. And I was like blown away. I was like, my God, Dr. Glover's writing this book about me. And like, and my wife were, and I were going through some, I wouldn't say, yeah, we're going through some stuff, I guess, or just like any normal couples do. And I said, Hey, look, you know, I'm listening to this book. It's been really good so far. And I was telling her about it. So we were actually out to dinner um, and we had about an hour drive back home and we listened to it together. And I remember her thinking or saying, um, she's like this most of the stuff sounds just like you. And I was like, yeah, I told you so. Um, there's a few things that weren't, like we said, like I, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty honest, you know, a lot of nice guys just like lie about stuff and even like stupid stuff, you know what I mean? Like stuff that doesn't really matter um, just to kind of avoid conflict and, and things like that. Um, and I don't feel like I have a lot of like 
sexual shame. Like I'm pretty open with my wife about everything in that regards. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like there's so many men out there that don't want to put the work in, but you can see like the cycle changing. Like I made the conscious decision. Okay. Um, like if my dad's a nice guy, then I'm going to be changing stuff myself. So it doesn't carry on in my son. And so many guys out there don't do that. And then, or the, their father's not there. So they're just trying to survive. And, you know, you think of some communities in the States, you know, like they might just be, I don't know if there's no father, then they're going through a lot of issues. They don't have, they're looking for that men's group, but they're looking for it in other ways, like gangs, things like that. People, friends that are up to no good, you know, that troublemakers and, you know, getting them into trouble. And then, like you said, they end up in jail and places like that. And then cycle kind of continues. So, um, yeah, it's be interesting to see. And that's kind of the work of, you know, I think like Traver, Traver Boehm and the man uncivilized, his mission is to, um, he, he, he knows it off the top of his head. Um, but it's like basically inspire a million men, you know, through their work, you know, to become conscious with their, their heart and their, you know, their head and their heart and kind of bring that mix together. Um, Dr. Glover's is, you know, to, to work with these men and bring men together good men doing better. That's the motto of, um, integration nation. So yeah, there's men out there and people out there that are trying to to help that crisis. But yeah, I think there's, it'd be interesting to see what happens over the next few years as that kind of men's space grows. Um, and because there's a lot of work to be, to be done. So what'd you say it was like nine, 19 million families or so, um, in America. And yeah. That's just, and it just in America. Yeah. And that's, that's so like I said, that's the breeding ground for nice guy syndrome is that, you know, no, no father in the, in the, in the family for the, for the children or, you know, a father that's absent, you know, and, and doing other things, working all the time, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, be interesting to see what happens over the next five, 10 years, I guess. One of the things that like really hits home about nice guys is being a bad receiver and there was a there was something said in the podcast with uh, chris and dr glover it was like being a bad receiver robs people the enjoyment of helping you mm. and i was like wow i hadn't even thought about it that way you know like i feel like i'm the type of guy like maybe too independent in some ways, you know, like someone will say, do you want help? And I'll be like, no, that's cool. I got it. You know, or even like say with Marissa, she were like, do you want help here? And I'll be like, no, no, it's okay. Don't worry. I got it. But I'd never thought about it. Like that's you actually robbing people, the enjoyment of helping you, you know, like, cause mm. you know, the human spirit actually wants to help. And, uh, mm. that's how we kind of are built really, you know, like, uh, we, 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 we really are like loving beings. And it, like it, literally since I heard that quote, I was like, I, every time say Marissa's uh, said, you need help with something that I would normally go, no, no, it's cool. I'll be like, yeah, no, no, I'll, you, you can, no, go for it, please. Because I, I'd never, ever thought of it that way. And, um, you know, and then, and then they also said something else. They went on like, if you're not able to receive help with like little things, what are you actually, what other, this is maybe causing a blockage in other parts of your life, you know, like how do you expect to be able to receive good health or, or wealth or, or other blessings if you're mm. not able to receive the small things like, you know, can I bring in the washing or can I fold your clothes or, or sort of thing? And I thought that was a, I was like, it, I had to take a step back after I heard that line. <laughs> well, I think it goes back to, you know, like the men are just supposed to be the provider, you know, and you got them mentality. Oh, no, like, like you said, being independent. And it's also like, you don't want to, you're not, you don't want to cause any trouble for someone else, like for your partner, you know, like, no, you don't need to do that. You just chill. I'll do everything, you know, whereas they want to help you. And it gives it, like you said, it gives them pleasure and enjoyment in helping, but you're basically rejecting that. And I think Dr. Glover, he had a few, um, uh, examples one was like his wife is always asking him if he needs help taking the trash out and he's like no it's basically walking here you know 20 feet down in the driveway and putting in the trash cans outside and his wife and he's like 
I realized she doesn't do it because she thinks I need help doing that. She doesn't think I need help carrying the actual bags. She just wants to spend time with me. She wants to spend that time with me. So now he'll say, yep, go ahead. And, you know, they'll walk down in the driveway together and dump the trash in. And that gives her enjoyment being able to spend time with him. So, yeah, I think um, that's a big one too. And And like you said, like being able to receive money. I think a lot of people have financial blocks. Um, like you said, and you know, I've had probably a few financial blocks and that money blocks as well with different things. Um, but yeah, just trying to get rid of those to, yeah, to be able to enjoy kind of the income coming in that I'm earning in my different businesses, you know, and, and not being scared of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause that was one of the, um, I guess t tendencies as well uh, of of the nice guy is that he's like he's fearful of success. Yep. And and that's an interesting one if you think about it. Like you like you think, oh, surely you want to be successful. You know what I mean? But actually, there is an underlying tension and fear of like, what happens if I do become successful, or, or will I get found out? Or what is the story there? Yeah, a lot of times with that. If they're successful, then they're looked upon higher to keep on being successful. So then what happens if, oh, I fail at something and then I look like a failure or so let's say I get this job and I'm not doing properly. I got to keep up with that, um, that high level all the time. So they just get scared of having to keep up with that kind of level that's expected of them because they've met that target or met that goal or they're at that level. You say they're at that top level, then they're like, oh shit, people are going to, um, expect me to stay at this top level forever, you know? So it's like, well, if I don't ever get there, then I'm not gonna have to worry about that. For example, think about like a professional athlete, the top of their game, you know? Oh, I'm at the top, I'm the top, uh, I don't know, baseball player, I'm the top soccer player in the world. I'm at to stay like this forever. Do they think like that? No, they're, they know that they're eventually gonna start going back down, you know, but they've hit that level. Um, they weren't afraid like, oh, so let's say, for example, it's like, say, a soccer player, a football player in the Premier League. Oh, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to get up to the Premier Leagues because it's too much pressure. What if I fail? You know what I mean? No, they're going for it, you know, as hard as they can until they reach that goal. So, um, yeah, a lot of nice guys. And that's it, it, like doesn't have to be professional sports. It could be any business, you know, like, oh, what if I get so successful and then I start letting people down? You know, people won't like me then. So, yeah. I think there's always that fear of keeping up with that higher level of being successful um, is a block with a lot of people. Yeah, it's really interesting. I actually like um, David Goggins in terms of how he, you know, talks around mindsets and you've got to like callous the mind and, um, you know, like really create this like insanely strong mindset and, and not care mm -hmm. what people think and like, just rely on yourself and you know like he i mean it's pretty incredible seeing some of the results and stories that that he posts and stuff uh, just from mm. guys that have read his book or listened to his posts and stuff like that and uh you know i think if we can take control of our mindset um and build that sort of fortitude and um uh you know uh, just strength then uh you know it's going to help all guys especially nice guys Mm, I love his, um, I forget the exact name of his, the tool, but I think it's like the, the mental cookie jar where you have this kind of, um, I, f I forget how he describes it, but to me, it's kind of like you're taking mental notes of all the successes that you had, you know? So like one cool thing that we've done together, Gareth, is when we did the Tough Mudder, you know, that was, uh, that's probably the longest I've ever ran, but then they include all these crazy obstacles and we were wearing these, um, in these like native American Indian costumes and loincloths and stuff. And, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Finished the tough mutter. And then, um, like four years ago, I, I hiked for charity, like, uh, 60 kilometers in a day. And yeah. So oh, I did this, oh, I've done this coaching program with Dr. Glover. So you got these things that you accomplished. Oh, I've started this food truck. If you're ever having like a shit day or think like, we have days where like, oh man, I'm a loser, you know, and you're just having a bad day and you need, you take those mental, like you dip into this mental cookie dart and you read the little notes like, oh yeah, I did this tough mutter and I finished that. You know, I didn't think I could, but yeah. So I love that idea to, of taking those notes and just to really boost, uh, 
your self confidence, different things. Um, yeah, that's one think, one of yeah. yeah one of my favorite takeaways from from Goggins. Yeah, and and I think that's important as well. You know, to like to remember that you're not invincible. You know, even if you're David mm. Goggins, you probably have a bad day. So yeah, just yeah. reminding yourself that that's not like a permanent thing is a good tool to have, you know? And I think, I think that's what a lot of like coaching and life and that comes to is like, it's actually going to be quite difficult a lot of the time, but you just need this sort of tools to help navigate your way through sort of whatever difficult moment it is that you're having. Um, mm. Another one actually that I like of his is the accountability mirror. And uh, mm. that's where you take like post-it notes and you yeah. like, you know, you almost hold yourself accountable and you, and you vision something every single day and you're like, okay, cool. On my post-it note, I've written, okay, cool. I'm going to do a hundred pushups today. Um, and so when you go brush your teeth, you're like, oh, flip, it's 10 PM and I haven't done my hundred pushups, but you, you can see it's there on your notes, you know? So <laughs> I, I, I thought that was a really cool one to, to kind of vision, like what it is that you should be doing. Yeah. That, um, a similar one that I've done and in that post, that first post you read, I think I had, um, finished 75 hard which is the uh, Andy Frisella program. And I've actually, my wife and I, Paul and I both did a uh, year to live hard, which is the the whole program. We did that. Um, but basically on your phone, there's an app that you tick off to different things that you do them throughout the day. And if you get to end the day, you get that it pops up. It's like, Oh, have you done everything today? And you're like, Oh shit, it's 10 PM. I haven't uh, read my 10 pages yet, or I haven't um, yet finished my gallon of water yet. So you got Andy Frisella like popped up on your app, like arms crossed. Like, have you done this today? Um, and yeah, then you kind of post it for accountability on Instagram. It keeps it, keeps it accountable for people to see it. Cause I didn't think many people paid attention, but as they got closer to the end of it, it keeps track of the days for you. And every day you post it when you've completed everything. How many people messaged me when I was getting close or had finished and been like either Oh, I can't wait to wait till you finish. Keep going. You're going good. Or when you finish, how people are like, Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. You finished it. You know, you're an inspiration. That was the cool thing of people saying that, um, you know, when I was just doing it and I was like, man, people are actually paying attention and, and it motivated people, which is really cool. So, um, yeah, those little accountability things, because when I first tried 75 hard, I didn't use the app. I just had like a a tick a thing on my phone where I just kind of kept track of myself and I failed after like three weeks or something like that. Um, you know, it's probably like, yeah, 15, 20 days I failed into it. And then Paula wanted to do it. That's when I started back up and she's like, Oh, do you know, there's an app for it. And I was like, Oh no, I thought you just did it. Kept track of it yourself. So yeah, just the little things, you know, just having that app for accountability to keep it going. But, um, yeah, yeah. Now that, um, inspiration was was key for me and that was uh, really the surprise takeaway of it is you know how many people got inspired by watching me do something like that it was crazy and the cool thing about that is is that you, you like you never really know who's watching a lot of the time you know mm. and, and so many people mm. are silent as well and like you said like afterwards like you'd finished and they're like oh well done you know i was watching you the whole time and you're like why the fuck didn't you say anything? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and like, and like, yeah, the amount of people like that you inspire that you have no idea. And that's kind of the, I forget you said it, but like, you know, the little ripples that you have, like, you know, if you throw a stone into water and just go, psh, you know, the, the ripples that go out from it. And it's kind of like the work that we do. It's like any post you put out there, you don't know who's going to see that, that needed that at that moment, you know, that's really helped them. So you don't really know how you're, your ripples are going to affect other people. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great one. Um, yeah. I mean, if people start using social media properly, like you can really have a big impact on, on people, you know, rather than just sitting mm. there doom scrolling and feeling like mm. empty and purposeless. Like if you actually go, okay, cool. I'm actually going to teach something, uh, or learn something. I mean, specifically teaching something, you know, in, in the context of what we're speaking about, uh, it, you know, people, people do listen and then they want that there. There's almost this craving for help and for good information. And, uh, mm. you know, like, uh, that, that's a, that's a really good, uh, been a really good lesson for me, actually, like the last four months I've, I come back to social media and I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this properly. And, um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's definitely the way to use it. I feel I was, um, I was just wondering, but what, just to go back to, to nice guys quickly, like mm -hmm. what, what, 
what is a way for a guy to to sort of get out of you know his own way in terms of being a nice guy and take back control um so i guess the first so so like i said i first found dr glover's book nor mission nice guy and i listened to it like we like we were talking about it actually took me a few times to read it and listen to it on audiobook and take action to it because in every at the end of every chapter there's what's called his breaking free steps so he has these breaking or breaking free activities and so it's basically how to break free from the nice guy syndrome and it um yeah i, I don't know how many people probably skip through them like i did but yeah if people would actually sit down and do them then their their journey would be a whole lot um easier i'd say um but i finally did it but yeah the, the probably the number one thing um is to find a safe person or two or three that they can talk to for example like how many guys have good friends that they can like kind of open up their heart and soul to you know what i mean most of the time you probably find guys their friends all they're talking about is like you know i wouldn't say nonsense stuff but specific um things that are basically oh, like sports that's all i talk about sports or work the weather stuff like that how many people you know that that's all they talk about they're not talking about or when they say oh how's your day oh good you know or how are you fine you know the typical responses how many guys are actually like oh how are you and then how many will respond with oh well actually you know at work today this happened and you know it really pissed me off and you know then i got home and my wife was nagging at me and then my kids were acting like acting like little assholes and you know so how many guys actually are going to sit down and talk to a friend like that about what they're feeling what they're going through um and because i think they they just tend to keep it all in they think that's oh you know like and then we talked about it earlier like it's not manly it's not the the tough thing to do to talk about your emotions and your feelings and what's going on you know you're you're a man you're supposed to handle that on your own and i think that's where the issue of the problem is, or that's where the problem is um so yeah finding a safe person that you can talk to um and for men especially as you get older you get out of school then your kind of network of friends slowly over the years get smaller you know you're you're might have school buddies that you that you grew up with you have tons of friends might have a lot of friends in university leave university you know be in your 20s or so you start working you might have a few friends but they start dropping off you get married you might move somewhere and you know like we met playing aussie rules football in london like we were all young guys out you know on our oes living the dream you know big city um and probably might, you might have known one or two people that maybe came over to london as well i didn't know really anybody um and so yeah i joined up had a friend that i met over there and he was an aussie guy, and he went and played aussie rules for the hawks and then that's where i met you guys and yeah that was kind of my network of friends while we're in london but even then like i think there's probably only a handful of guys now that i still talk to from there so um yeah but then yeah moves moved here and, and similar like probably story with a lot of guys they're moving somewhere with work or with their family and that's all they have then is their work and family so yeah finding a, a community of men that you know you can talk to you can do things with um and that way you're not relying on your wife to fill all your needs so you're getting your needs needs met from other other places other men um yeah i think one of Go the ahead. really important takeaways as well for men is that it's actually much easier to speak about your struggles with strangers than it is mm. like with your mates you know and uh, that, that, so so don't be afraid to join a men's group because you're like oh i don't really know anyone because the reason is is like the issues you, you you're struggling with are actually easier to say you know because there's there's not really there's not the same judgment as the in as there is mm. with your buddies you know like because your buddies have like known you since high school and you were the the jock of the school and blah 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 you know so you can't really go well mm, you know guys i'm really struggling of course you can you know once you've done your own work you realize oh fuck, it doesn't really matter and i'm probably helping them out if i do if i am vulnerable like that 
um, but but not many guys are, are at that stage yet. So so speaking to strangers about your problems can actually sometimes really help you. Oh, I agree. Yeah, no, like when I first joined the men's the men's group, um, the Uncivilized Nation, like some of those guys became some of my best friends because I was able to do that. You know, like, and I've actually like my two, two couple of my really best friends that I grew up with. Um, we still keep in contact. And when I was back in the States, I hung out with one of them. The other one lives across the country, but we, we did our own podcast together and like, yeah, we, we talk all the time and we're able to talk about stuff like that, like about the problems that we're having and our, you know, with work or relationships, all that stuff. And, you know, just share on that deeper level than just like talk about baseball or talk about, you know, other things that don't really matter um, in the long run, you know? So um, I'm lucky enough in that regards, but yeah, years ago, I probably wouldn't have been, you know, open to share with my closest friends, that stuff, just that, I think it's that fear of judgment of, or, um, yeah, just, uh, just cause I've known you your whole life and yeah, you don't want to think different of you. Maybe you have a, a subconscious thing like, oh, they're not going to want to be my friend. If I tell them that, you know, I'm struggling with something or I'm depressed or anything like that, but lots of times the guys in the men's groups, you know, they're going through the same stuff as you. Lots of times that's why they join the men's groups too. Um, and so you have that common, that commonality between kind of your struggles that you're going through. So it kind of brings you together, but yeah, if anyone is scared or nervous or, you know, apprehensive about sharing stuff with strangers, yeah, don't be, because most of those guys are going to be there for those same exact reasons. And, you know, just by you sharing that can help someone else then to, you know, help with their own, their own, or their own issues. Exactly. You almost like give them permission to now share their story. Cause you've gone, you've like opened up your heart and you're like, you know, this mm. is my, my issue that I'm struggling with. And then the other guy's like, oh, cool. I can actually talk about it now, you know, cause, cause mm. he's also spoken. I'm going through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So no, but it's, it's really important to try and find that sort of, uh, that group of blokes. And, you know, if you can, if it is also your old, old buddies and stuff and you can open up to them even better, I think it's, uh, cause that, mm. that then like really deepens that relationship and, um, you know, I guess kind of guarantees it for, for life. Uh, I was just yep. wondering, yep. um, as we kind of like sort of start finishing off now, like what are you most excited about, about the future and like have coming up that would be cool for people to know about? Um, yeah. So, oh, in, in the two kind of things that I'm doing at the moment, the coaching and the food truck. So I'll start with the food truck. Um, we're looking at expanding to some different locations, possibly. Yeah. It's still a bit in the works, but yeah, I've been uh, in December worked with a friend of ours who's an entrepreneur and he's got a few different businesses and really awesomely business minded, very similar pages that I am uh, mindset wise. And yeah, just a real kind of mentor um, relationship kind of. So I went up and stayed with them for a week or for a couple of days. And yeah, like we first went on this like hour long walk, basically just talking about branding. And he's like, cause he's really, he's a, a huge into marketing. So he has a marketing company, but so yeah, basically a really good chat of someone with someone who has walked the walk, you know what I mean? Is, and is keen to share that stuff. So really, really awesome. And then we kind of sat down, had a whiteboard session on the possibilities of what it looked like if I ex expanded and um, franchised and what it could look like in terms of like locations and, you know, what I would be part of the business side of it. Do I, you know, it's just a whole lot of just stuff down that I hadn't really thought about, but it was awesome to hear from someone who, has been down that road and teaching and learning. So that's kind of the exciting part of that is to eventually I'd like to get off the tools in the food truck, you know, get off the, the old flipper and the scraper and um, hand that over, which has been quite tough to do at the moment. Like I, I have probably some blocks in there that I need to work on, on, you know, giving away my baby, you know, to someone that can do it um, properly. And that will free up more time. Uh, but yeah, just looking to see where Buffalo's American food company goes, might have a, a Buffalo's Brazil one day, China down the road from you. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Um, but I'd love to like expand back home to my, to the States, you know, and we're going back, like I said, this year. And I, I want to do a pop-up, a friend of mine, one of my good buddies I grew up with, I told him and he's like, leave me to it. So he's in the works of lining something up, but that's going to be real cool to, so only my mom and dad and well, my mom's the only actually had from the food truck itself, but I made my burgers, similar burgers over in the States for my brother and his family and my mom and dad, but it's my grandma's 90th birthday um, in June. So when we're over there, we're going to have a big party and I'm going to do all the burgers and stuff. So it will be real special, like being able to do my smash burgers for them, um, for my family, you know, cause yeah, especially I wish like my grandpa would, was there cause he would have just got a kick out of it, but you know, I think he'll be there in spirit, but being able to, to cook them up for my rest of my family is going to be awesome. Just real special too. Um, and then as far as coaching, yeah, just really keep been going with it, with the way it's going. It's great. You know, helping other men helping. Um, and I don't work with just with nice guys. I work with all types of, um, of men, but yeah, that's kind of majority of my clients are the nice guys, but also building up the integration nation, the men's community with Dr. Glover and the other coaches, the other um, six coaches that helped me f that helped found it with Dr. Glover. Um, so yeah, just seeing how that grows, like into kind of more in-person meetups right now, it's just, um, an online program platform and community, but yeah, as it grows, there's plans to have it more kind of localized to different places and have annual meetups and things like that. So yeah, really looking forward to kind of where it's, where it's going in that sense. That sounds exciting, like converting that like online world into real life world. And I think, uh, yeah, mm. like that's mm. where the guys get like real benefits, you know, in retreats and then all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's, yeah, man, it sounds, sounds super exciting, but like definitely living a, <laughs> a full purposeful life, which is really cool. And, uh, and, and my last question, which, uh, I haven't actually gone back and listened to the, the original one, but like, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think. Yes, I actually, it wasn't on the, the shortened segment that I listened to either. Cause I was thinking about that. Um, so I can't remember what I actually said four years ago, but to be ridiculously human now for me is to take your dreams and do something about it and to do it and to find that rich life in yourself to get what you want, I think would be, yeah, the way I would put it. Yeah. Well, it's a great way of putting it, bud. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, take, take action, you know, like you have this one life, mm. like just seriously go for it. Uh, just, it. Um, just go for it. Yeah. I mean, flipping hell life is so short and, uh, you know, next thing you know, it's like you, you're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to say about it's, it's like, it's a pleasure having a buddy like you, you know, the, the, as we were talking in the conversation, like they, you don't always have uh conversations like this with your close buddies um mm. i consider you a close buddy so having you a, a, a conversation like this with you is special uh, having that connection is special uh but also just like i find this awesome feeling being proud of my buddies and <laughs> i i feel like super proud of you but like for for what you've done how you've turned like it's not like you weren't living a great life and you're not like you hadn't done a ton of things. I mean, you'd, you'd done a ton of amazing things up until, you know, you decided to start doing a ton more amazing things. And, uh, <laughs> but just like really taking control of your time now and your destiny is, uh, is like inspiring. And I, I really hope, uh, people, uh, listen deeply to kind of like, you know, the changes that you made and, and how you've gone about it and, and tr apply those lessons to their own lives. So thanks again, brother. I flip and love you, man. And uh, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. No, I agree, man. It's the same. And like you said, it's not many guys that I have in my life, you know, from my younger years that we can sit down and have conversations like this. And you hear a lot of relationships, people with friends, but also married people that one grows and the other is just happy sitting and staying content. And that relationship tends to fade up, fade away or kind of split apart. You know what I mean? As one person grows, the other person is just happy being the way they have always been. Um, whereas us, I think we're both 
have done a lot of work on ourselves and have grown quite a bit. And that's why we still kind of connect so well is because we've made those changes and we're all about making ourselves better. We're not content sitting, sitting, standing by and just being how it used to be. You're an inspiring father and an inspiring man, but, uh, you know, thanks for sharing <laughs> everything. So, so yeah. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Thanks brother. Buddy. You too. No, I love your, I love your stuff, and I, I love, I've loved our chat again. So maybe I'll be the a third person that's, or uh, be the first person that's doing a third, a third podcast with you. <laughs> oh, that, that's the, that, that's I hope, bud. Definitely, um, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> cool, man. 